Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. This is uh, Mountain Preacher and Jesus podcast coming at you from Spokane, Washington. I'm excited to share with you today the end of chapter one in my book that I wrote, Does God Stand with Israel? Obviously, I encourage you to grab it off of Amazon. Uh, the reason I do, I'm going to go through each chapter and I'm going to cover each chapter semi in depth um, you're going to get a lot more out of the book plus if you get the book you're going to be able to go through it a lot faster because i'm going to do um, these podcasts through the whole book it's going to probably take you know two to three per chapter based on just the amount of information and the progress of going through it the process of going through it so i encourage you to grab the book it's on amazon does god stand with israel this is chapter one episode two um, obviously I have to admit that, um, this particular camp that I'm in when it comes to my thought process and being an amillennialist is certainly not the most popular camp out there, although it's making a huge comeback in Christianity because I believe, uh, the dispensational camp out there you know, that believes in the rapture of the church, believes in a seven year tribulation and, uh, all those different kind of things about end time theology. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to prove <coughs> that um, none of that exists in scripture, um, especially uh, the seven year tribulation, the the rapture of the church, and then God coming back and, you know, having a seven year tribulation after that, and then coming back and dealing with Israel. What that shows you is that God had two different plans in mind and two different people group in mind. In chapter one, I've already shared with you the first half of the chapter that God's always had one plan. He's never had two plans. He's never had two people groups. He doesn't love uh, Jews more than any other person or people group. He doesn't love Americans more than he loves uh, Hispanics, or he doesn't love Americans more than he loves Chinese or anything like that. Um, it's complete nonsense to believe that there's a particular people group out there that God loves more than somebody else. Um, we're, we, we get very in depth in this. We cover, you know, all the, the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, or if you want to call that Sinai, the Sinai covenant, um, Davidic covenant, we cover those pretty in depth. And what the Bible clearly shows and clearly proves, and this is one of the goals and the main point of the book, is that Jesus Christ and him crucified is the centerpiece. It's the focal point of all scripture. Uh, Paul himself, who wrote 13 of the New Testament books, said, if I had to preach one thing and one thing only, and he narrowed it down to to one phrase, it would be Christ and Christ crucified. Um, that's it. That is the focal point. And the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant are all fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Um, in other words, Jesus is the focal point in the beginning of scripture, in the middle of scripture, at the end of scripture. So all of scripture, the focal point is Jesus. And that is completely the focal point and the, the whole focus and the goal of scripture is salvation through christ jesus so much of the old testament which we will go through um it was mysterious the the prophets and the writers of the old testament um and we're going to go over some of that today very clearly prophesied and wrote down what god gave them but they full, didn't fully understand what they were writing about they didn't uh, know the full timing of things they didn't know the fullness of everything that was going to be completed in christ jesus but um obviously we're going to learn today and it's so important that the new testament um and the new testament writers show us and they interpret for us the old testament um I'm going to say some things, and through the book, it's fairly easy to prove these out, but I will some say some things that I won't automatically back up um, right away, but they will be backed up as we go through the book. But um, the New Testament opens up the Old Testament, the mysterious parts of the Old Testament that, um, that we see, we read about, um, prophetic words about Israel, prophetic words about uh, the future of the Jews and all sorts of different things, all the covenants and all those things are fulfilled in the New Testament. And we see those fulfillments come to pass in Christ Jesus. 
We see a completely different covenant in the new rather than, uh, compared to the old. So there's so many things to learn. And I don't want to come across as um, hateful or anything like that. And I'm certainly, please do not in any way, shape or form, believe that I'm anti-Semitic in any way. Um, clearly, and I prove it in scripture as well, God loves, absolutely loves the Jewish people. He still does and he always will. They are always continually invited into the kingdom of God. The thing that we need to need to realize, there's not a plan for the Jews and a separate plan for the Gentiles. When we study, and I think I have three chapters in the book on the Abrahamic covenant, in that the Abrahamic covenant, God said, Abraham, you're going to bless all the nations. You're going to bless all the families, not just the Jewish people, not just the Jews, which there was no such a thing at that particular time. But the covenant of Abraham was very much a covenant that's still into effect today and is continually being filled in Christ Jesus and the church of Jesus Christ, which is included uh, with Jews and Gentiles. So we're going to learn all that. I realize that um, so many people, and hopefully you're listening to this with a heart that you want to learn. Um, I've been a Christian for 38 years. Many of you that are hearing my voice right now are way smarter than I am, know probably theology better than I do, but I've studied this back and forth for at least 30 years, very in-depthly between dispensationalism and and amillennialism and end time theology and and literally 30 years of studying this that doesn't mean that i'm right or wrong it just means that i've i've looked at both sides what i'm asking you to do if you're camped out on one side or the other that you would look at all sides you would look at both sides that's what we're supposed to do as christians is look at all the aspects of what's going on i want to start out today again this is chapter one uh episode two this we're going to finish up on chapter one today I want to read something here that I wrote in the book. Uh, I will not read a lot of stuff that I wrote because there, there's just a lot more stuff in the book that I'm going to say, but there are some things I think that are important um, to get my point across that I'm going to read to you right now. And that's this. In the Old Testament, God's faithful remnant refers to a group of individuals who remain steadfast in their devotion to him amidst the spiritual decline and apostasy of the broader community. Throughout Israel's history, there were moments of disobedience and rebellion leading to divine judgment and exile. However, within this tumultuous context, there was always existed a few faithful who clung to God's promises <clears throat> and followed his commandments. These faithful individuals, often portrayed as prophets, key uh, righteous kings, um, where there weren't very many of it all, and also um ordinary believers like us today, but ordinary Jews and very few Gentiles sprinkled throughout there. They served as a beacon of hope and a testimony to God's enduring faithfulness. They exemplified the essence of true worship and genuine faith, embodying the core values of righteousness, mercy, and justice. Their connection to God's church, the faithful people, or the true children of Abraham lies in their shared commitment of, to God's covenant relationship and their anticipation of the fulfillment of his promises, just as the faithful remnant in the Old Testament preserved the spiritual heritage of Israel, so too does the church today continue its this legacy, being comprised of um, those who, by faith, are counted as true descendants of Abraham and heirs according to the promise, which is Galatians 3.29. Through their unwavering faith and obedience, the faithful remnant of old foreshadowed the enduring faithfulness of God's people throughout history, culminating in the global body of believers known as the church or the body of Christ, uni unified by their shared allegiance to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> One of the main things you're going to learn in this book is that the true people of God or a true Israelite, or a true Jew, is not someone of Jewish descent. It is somebody that is faithful to Jesus Christ, who is in Christ Jesus. That is made up, obviously, with Jews and Gentiles. Many more Gentile now than there ever was, because there's just so many more Gentiles in the world than there are Jews. There's a few million Jews compared to billions of Gentiles, so the ratio, obviously, is way more Percentage-wise, there might be more Jews that are actually in Christ than Gentiles when it comes to just the percentage of the amount of people, because there's a lot more, lot less Jews. 
Here is, before I continue on, here's one of the probably primary purposes of this book, Does God Stand with Israel? Um, I despise it, and it's a pet peeve of mine when I see Christians and hear Christians. I love debating theology and talking about theology. I, I don't like debating. I like talking about it because I like learning from other people. So I'm, I'm not a debater, but I love learning and talking and learning from others um, what, they're, what they believe and so forth. And obviously, I've read many theologians over the years, again, that are way smarter than I am. But it's my pet peeve that Christians are on social media talking about the end times and the Antichrist and a seven-year tribulation and uh, the rapture of the church and God taking the church out and then dealing with Israel and all, all these things that aren't in the Bible. I see Christians in, you know, some, some of them look like they're 19, some of them look like they're young 20s, and obviously you have the ones that are my age as well. But they're saying all this stuff as it's like, matter of fact, like it's factual, that the Bible is just so clear on all this stuff when, uh, and I, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you. I've done this a few times over the years. Um, find me in the Bible where it talks about a seven-year tribulation. There is no mention of a seven-year tribulation in the Bible. There is no mention of God coming and taking out his church, the body of Christ, which is what they call a rapture. And then coming back after seven years of tribulation, and it doesn't, it's not there. I, I, to, to, to get to the points that dispensationalists have to get to, um, they have to do a lot of scrambling of scripture. They have to do a lot of interjection of their thoughts. In other words, and I, I'm just trying to be honest with you here. When you study scripture, you have to study scripture from the point of, okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what's going on here. I want to learn what the scripture, I, in other words, I have a heart to know what does the scripture say instead of, I want to prove my point from scripture. That's not studying scripture. And again, we're all guilty of that to a certain point. I understand that, but we have to be honest. We have to be real and say, what does the scripture actually say? This is why in my introduction to this book, I was so confused for so many years of, man, I, I read the Bible, I study it. And I'm, I'm talking you know, hours upon hours and hundreds and, and even thousands of hours of study. Again, I'm not that I'm that smart at all, but I'm just, I studied a lot and I would come to some semi -con conclusions. Um, and then I would read some people and go, okay, that makes sense. That's, that's what I got out of it. So it makes sense what this particular person saying. And then I would listen to a series. Someone teaches series on end time stuff and wars and worms of wars and in the antichrist and the mark of the beast and all this kind of stuff. And I had to go, man, it just, it just threw confusion into me because I don't see any of that in scripture or I, I see, see it in scripture, but see it already as fulfilled. But then, so it kind of bring me back to the starting point again. Okay, I got to do this. I got to study it again and so forth. So my heart and my main goal of this book is that you as a Christian, sure, you're going to, if you believe in all the end time stuff and, and you're a dispensationalist, that's fine. We're, we're both followers of Jesus, and I appreciate that. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. But our job is not to scare people or create fear. Our job is to love God with all of our heart and love people, love sinners like Jesus loves sinners. I hate it, and it's my pet peeve when I see a dispensationalist say, you know, this is coming next week. Jesus is coming back rapture, all this kind of stuff, mark of the beast, and all these fearful things. And then um, their heart isn't to really see sinners get saved. It's just like if they throw out this warning of, man, you better get saved, turn or burn, baby. It's like, why don't you go out and make disciples of Jesus and love sinners? Now, there are a lot of dispensationalists that do do that. They they love people, they love God, and they um, absolutely, truly love to disciple people. But so many of dispensational teaching, it's just they throw out all these fear-mongering things, get ready, better be prepared. And yes, we're supposed to be prepared, but our heart is to love God and love people and to make disciples of Jesus. Whether we know Jesus is coming back next week or in 10,000 years, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that we're actually out on the streets in the workplace, making disciples of Jesus, not just throwing out bombs. You better be ready or turn and burn, baby. You better accept Jesus now or you're going to hell. 
that's what I hate. I hate the attitude of, I'm just going to warn you and throw things at you, but I'm not going to go love you and walk with you and teach you how to walk like Jesus and be like Jesus. That's my heart. That's the main purpose of this book is that we would absolutely love people and love God. All right. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament. Some scriptures here I just want to go over. I'm going to read one more paragraph here to you out of the book. Dispensationalists tend to interpret the Old Testament with a forward-looking perspective toward the New Testament, but a more comprehensive approach involves interpreting the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Now, what do I mean by that? If you just go in the Old Testament and look at all the promises to Israel, the land, and all sorts of different things, the promises that God made to them, there's no question. It it says it's eternal. It says all these things. It's, so I would, I would agree with you 1,000%. But we have this thing called the New Testament, and we see the fulfillment of all those promises that God made to in his covenant with Israel and his promises to Israel and the Jewish uh, nation. Uh, they're all fulfilled in the New Testament. The New Testament shows us they're completely fulfilled. The Mosaic covenant is completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Davidic covenant is completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the king of kings. He is that king from the root of from the 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 loins of david he and i'm going to prove that out in one chapter jesus is the fulfillment of that jesus is the fulfillment of the abrahamic covenant and the church his body the the body of christ is the um fulfillment of the abrahamic covenant right along with jesus and that when i say just so you know when i say church and body of christ and i'm not talking about a gentile church i'm talking about the church of jesus christ which is made up of jew and gentile there's no such thing as a Gentile church. There's a lot more Gentiles in the church because there's a lot more Gentiles in the world. The church is made up of all races and denominations and throughout the whole world at all time. It's not a Gentile church. And that's some of the language when you hear that, it sets people off and go, oh, he's just talking about a church and it's just this Gentile. No, it's not. It's If you look at the book of Acts that started the New Testament church, um, it's very clear that the large majority, and who knows the percentage, I'm going to throw out 98%, 95% of all the people saved in the first few years were probably Jews. Within a couple of years, obviously, those church plants went all over the, the Roman Empire, like God wanted to do in the Old Testament, and it never happened, because the, the Isra Israel disobeyed God so much. But within a couple, three, four, five years, there were churches and church plants all over the Roman Empire, which was God's heart all along, and those churches continue to spread all over the world, which we see today. So dispensationalists tend to look at the Old Testament and go, yeah, the, look at this promise, this promise is forever, this promise is forever, and I agree with you, it is forever, but the promise is fulfilled in Christ Jesus and it still continues on forever. Yes, it does. It's easy to prove that stuff out, but you got to be able to say, okay, I want to learn something new. Um, like I've, again, I want uh, all the different um, focuses on revelation and I want to continue to learn. Uh, there's things I don't know. And there's things that I can still learn from all the different camps out there. But let's jump into some scriptures here in Luke 24. Um, um, well, let's do, um, let's do uh, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10 first. And some of these are not exact quotes of the scripture. I'm going to talk about the scripture, but if you turn to Ephesians, you could study this out. Uh, and I think most of the scriptures I have here are New Living Translation or New King James. Um, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 says this, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in all things in Christ Jesus, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Jesus or in him. Again, the fullness of everything is Jesus Christ. It's not Israel. It's not the Jewish race. It's not a Gentile church. It's nothing. It's in Christ Jesus. And then everybody that is in Christ Jesus is part of that covenant, obviously, the ultimate, Abra the Abrahamic covenant. Now, in Ephesians 1, Paul mentions this mystery. And it, we're going to read some out of Ephesians 3 as well, which we already did in the first episode. But Paul says in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 3, that God gave him the answers to the mysteries of the Old Testament, which he also gave 
to the rest of the disciples. And we have all those now because we have the New Testament. But in the beginning of the New Testament, when they were thinking about writing and all the writers, God gave specifically, and, and I have a, a, a verse in here from First Peter as well, um, and he, he basically anointed the, the disciples and the Apostle Paul as well to understand all the mysteries of the Old Testament, which they, no one understood them then until then. That's why when you look at Scripture as a dispensationalist, you can't just look at the Old Testament and think that follows through all the way to the end of the age or the end of the earth. Um, it's completed in the New Testament because the New Testament shows those things. For example, I'm just going down a rabbit trail right now. The um, Old Testament clearly shows that God fulfilled all his promises when it came to the land that he gave Israel. And the New Testament shows the fulfillment of the land isn't a tiny little piece of land in the Middle East, even though that was a starting point. And God fulfilled that, which I have, it's a whole chapter just on that. But in Romans 4, verse 13, it says, that God gave Abraham the entire earth. Now, let's think about that for a second. The fulfillment of the land promises is not a little piece of land in the Middle East known as the state of Israel right now. The fulfillment of the prophecy about the land and the promise of the land is the whole earth, because what is the whole earth? The whole earth is the kingdom of God. So we're focused on Jesus and the kingdom of God, and the whole earth is filled with the kingdom of God. That's the fulfillment of the land promise. The land promise is not a this little country in the Middle East. It is the fullness of everything, which is the whole earth. I'll get into that later in a chapter. In Luke 24, and again, these are all in my book um, and more scriptures as well that I'm just I'm just skimming through it here. In Luke 24, 44, it says this. Then he said to them, Jesus, talking about Jesus, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and of the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now, what did Jesus just say? Everything in the law, everything in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms focused on who? Focused on Jesus. So I ask you today, if you are religious and you believe in God and you re reject Jesus, you have a real issue. We have a whole chapter on that as well. And Jesus said, uh, <laughs> you are of your father, the devil, because you don't believe in me. We're, we go through very specifically those, those scriptures in Matthew 21 and through Matthew 24. But um, Jesus is very clear. Everything in the Old Testament, the whole focus and the, the centrality of it and the, the, the main goal, and the main focus is me. It's me, Jesus, talking in the first person 2,000 years ago. And he told us to his disciples. Um, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry here into the city in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Again, Luke makes it very clear. Jesus opened the eyes of the disciples so they could see and understand all the scriptures that are written about Jesus. And there's many, I think there's about 350 different prophetic or prophecies about the Messiah. Those were all fulfilled in Christ Jesus. In first Peter um, chapter one, verses uh, 10 through 12, it says this, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would um, come to you, Ser uh, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, these things which angels desire to look into. So let me just read an explanation of that section of scripture. But Jesus is, or Peter's saying the same thing that Jesus said, or that Luke said in Luke 24, and he's saying the same thing that Paul said in Ephesians 1 and chapter 3 as well. So Peter, in his letter, speaks of the prophets of the Old Testament who prophesied about the salvation that would come. 
these prophets inspired by the Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, searched and inquired about the timing and details of the events that prop they prophesied. They were aware that they were ministering not only to their own generation, but also to future generations, including those whom Peter was writing. Peter emphasizes that the things prophesied by the Old Testament prophets have now been reported to the believers through preaching of the gospel by the apostles, who were guided by the Holy Spirit. So let me just say this in a nutshell, and it's really important. It's a little bit maybe black and white, might be a little offensive to some. But you could take, and again, I am not in any way anti-Semitic. I'm pro-Jew. I'm pro-American. I'm pro-Russian. I'm pro-Hispanic. I'm pro-Chinese. I'm pro-Brazilian. I'm pro-everybody. I'm not anti-any people group, especially I'm not anti-Jew in any way. But you could take the most knowledgeable Jew today that is a rabbi, that is not born again, that does not have the Holy Spirit in their life, and they might have the whole Old Testament completely memorized, and they will not know as much as you and I when it comes to the Old Testament, because we have the New Testament to open up the understanding of the Old Testament. Now, that might be a little bit cocky to say that. And again, I am not a smart person at all when it comes to um, some of the people that I've read and, and studied before when it comes to theology. But the Old Testament is opened up and understood because we have the New Testament. So if you are a rabbi, a Jew, or not even a Jew, but you're just, you, you're an Old Testament scholar, but you are unsaved and you've never read the New Testament, you still do not know the mysteries of the Old Testament. You know a lot, you know a lot more than I do about the Old Testament, but you don't know the mysteries and the fulfillment of all those things that are in Christ Jesus. And that's the focal point is what are the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies about the Jewish community, about Israel, about the covenants and about everything. What are the prophets? What are they? What are the fulfillments of those prophecies? And they're all fulfilled and they show us fulfillment in the New Testament. Here's some examples of what Peter was talking about. In Isaiah 53, we know this, one of the, the suffering servant, um, Isaiah wrote, um, who has believed our message, to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground, yet it was our weaknesses he carried, it was our sorrows he wa that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten. Obviously, he's talking about Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, all the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, I'm going to open your understanding to see everything that was talking about me. Yesterday, you had no clue. And you had, you had even though you might have known the old covenant, just like the Apostle Paul, you had no clue these were talking about me. But because I'm going to open your understanding right now, you're going to fully understand all these are talking about me and the fulfillment of all these prophecies are me standing before you right now. In Daniel chapter nine, verses uh, in verse 24, talks about a, a period of 70 sets of seven and been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophetic vision and to anoint the most holy place. Uh, Daniel's talking about Jesus. And we're actually, I have a whole chapter on the 70 weeks of Daniel because dispensationalists take that full, those four verses there. And this is where they get their, this is where they twist scripture so much. It's crazy to think about it, but there's nowhere in Daniel 70 week prophecy, prophecy where it says there's any kind of break or separation his prophecy goes from where it was decreed, which we'll talk about later up until Christ Jesus. And, and that's it. That's the 70 week prophecy. And dispensationalists say, well, wait a minute. The 70th week hasn't been completed yet. So there's a gap. This gap has been 2000 years. Nowhere in scripture does it hint of a gap in a 70 week prophecy. Nowhere in scripture does it hint that there's even any kind of gap in there at all. There's no gap in there. And the, the fulfillment of Daniel's 70 week prophecy was fulfilled in Christ Jesus right there. Dispensationalists 
say because they have a certain thinking point um, and a third a certain way of thinking through the things that in order for their their version to be right, then there has to be a gap in Daniel's prophecy when there is no place or no hint in scripture that there is a gap in Daniel's prophecy. Now, there's some other scriptures in I wrote in the book that just very common ones that you know about that are in there that talk about, obviously, Jesus, the Messiah, and so forth, and the fulfillment of that. I, wanna, um, I went through in, in chapter one, the first episode in Ephesians three, where Paul talks about um, the church and stuff. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to go through it again. Not much, just a few minutes here to close out this particular episode. But it's important that we understand God's always had one plan and only one plan. His plan is not for Jews over here and Gentiles over here. It's always been a combination of the both. Yes, there was a Jewish nation in the Old Testament that was supposed to be the kingdom of God and reach the world evangelistically for God, and it never did. It completely failed because of rebellion. That's why Jesus divorced them and gave the kingdom to another group of people. That group of people were another Jews, um, but it was called the body of Christ, the true body, true Israel, the true body of Christ, a true a true Jew, which we get into all those uh, terminology, and and there's two or three chapters just on what it means to be a true Israelite or a true Jew. So it's so important that we look at these things and go, okay, what is what is how does the New Testament interpret what the Old Testament sayings are? And Paul talks about this mystery again in Ephesians chapter three, and I'm just going to read this again, starting in verse ten. Um, it encapsulated a pivotal revelation regarding God's external purpose and the significance of the church and his divine plan of redemption. Paul, I'm, I'm more explaining this right now than actually reading the word itself. Paul explains that the church, as the embodiment of believers across time and space, serves as a conduit through which God's multifaceted wisdom is unveiled not only to humanity, but also to celestial beings. This underscores the profound role of the church. Again, that's Jew and Gentile. That is not Gentile. The church, the body of Christ, in the cosmic narrative of God's eternal purpose, highlighting its pivotal position and showcasing the depths of God's wisdom and the richness of his grace. Moreover, this passage challenges conventional notions that prioritize national or ethnic Israel as a primary recipient of God's favor. Instead, emphasizing the universal nature of God's redemptive plan, Paul's message echoes throughout both the Old and New Testaments, revealing a continuity in God's conventional faithfulness and underscoring that the true children of God are not defined by lineage or nationality, but by faithfulness and belief in Christ. Belief in Christ. Through Ephesians 3, verses 10 through 11, Paul unveils God's external purpose, his eternal purpose, where the church emerges as the focal point of his divine revelation, showcasing the unity and diversity of the believers across ages and cultures in the harmonious sympathy of God's wisdom and grace. Let me say this to end this out. The church of God, now again, when I say terms like that, right away you think of modern day church in America, and I'm not talking about that. We're certainly a part of it. I'm talking about the people of God from the beginning in Genesis until the end of Revelation. It's always been one group of people, and that group of people have been from all different nations and ethnic groups throughout history. Yes, we have, we're going to cover the covenant of Moses, and, or, and we're going to cover all that in histories or Israel's history and all that. I have nothing negative to say. It's, it's right there in plain text that God set up the nation of Israel as a political nation at the in, the in the wilderness with Moses, that they would be a nation that God would use as his kingdom. Now, again, it all failed because of rebellion. So, and there's nothing against the Jews for that. Any group would have done the same thing because of idolatry and rebellion in our flesh. We, we would have wanted to seek after other gods just like they did. So I'm not even knocking the Jews for doing that because we would have all done the same thing. What I'm saying, though, is this, is that the Abrahamic covenant supersedes all covenants 
because it shows us way before the Mosaic Covenant ever existed that God's going to bless the whole world, all the families, all the nations, all the people groups through the faith of Abraham. In other words, if you had the faith of Abraham in the Old Testament, you were a child of God. You were part of God's family. If you have the faith of Abraham today, you are in the church of the living God, the body of Christ made up of Jew and Gentile. You are a child of Abraham, a spiritual child of Abraham. If you look at the beginning of the covenant of Abraham, which we'll cover later, um, through the end of the covenant, there are several scriptures in, in different chapters in the book of Genesis. It doesn't matter that you were even in his family, in his bloodline, you still had to have faith in order to be a child of God. And that's so important that we recognize that. Here's the, the problem or here's the fault or the error that Christians think today. Well, if you are a Jew, then you are one of God's kids. No, you're not. If you are a Jew that has faith in Christ, then yes, you are. If you are a Jew or a, an American or a Scottish like me, that's what my main heritage is Scottish, or a Russian or Hispanic or whatever you're from, and you reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah, then Jesus himself calls you a child of the devil. So when I was 19, before I got saved, I rejected God. I, I knew who God was. I knew about him, but I rejected God. I rejected Jesus Christ because of my actions in my life. That made me a child of the devil, just like Jesus calls the Israelites in Matthew 21 and through 24. So we're going to learn all that, but it's just important. Chapter one, we understand that God's had one plan. That plan's been the same plan all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament. That in plan includes anybody who wants to have faith in God, Jew and Gentile, okay? It also, in chapter one, it shows very clearly that the New Testament, because Jesus opened the eyes of the disciples so they could write about the Old, they can answer all the questions of the Old Testament, basically. The New Testament is needed to interpret the Old Testament, and they are coherent. They go hand in hand. Uh, there's so much connection and coherency there between the Old Testament and the New. You can't have one without the other and fully understand what's going on. If you just had the New Testament, you would see, yes, salvation of Christ. You would see all those things, but you would have no clue what a lot of the New Testament is saying because it's interpreting the Old Testament and it's answering questions from the Old Covenant and the Old Testament. So be blessed. This is Mountain Preacher and Jesus Podcast. Um, I ask you, please share this. Um, I'm not looking for a fight. I'm looking to help people understand, let's quit talking about end times and let's start doing what Jesus asks us to do, which is make disciples. Yes, every Christian should believe that there will be the day that Christ comes back, but Nothing that we can do will affect that at all. It's just going to happen when God wants it to happen. In the meantime, it's our job not to think about it, not to be fearful about it, or it's our job to actually make disciples. If you're just warning people and throwing stuff out, turn or burn, all you're, all you're doing is hurting people's faith. You're not helping anybody at all. If you want to help people, go out onto the highways and byways and invite people into the church that you go to, and you disciple them. You connect with them. You love them. You teach them the commandments of Christ, that which he says in Matthew 28. So be blessed. Uh, I pray for everybody. Again, this is not a fight. This is just to learn that let's quit talking about end time stuff and let's start doing what Jesus asked us to do, which is to make disciples of him. Amen. Be blessed. Mountain Preacher signing off.